Hello everyone and welcome back to Shapeshifter's Den, a place where we discuss all things related to self-transformation through conscious movement. Today's video is an introduction to Olympic weightlifting. First covering what Olympic lifting actually is, then moving on to the reasons why somebody might Olympic lift, and finally we'll go over how one properly and safely accomplishes these lifts. And after the video, if you feel you would like to pursue Olympic lifting any further and possibly even add it to your movement routine, consider checking out the new Shapeshifter's Den Olympic lifting poster in the description box below. So what are the Olympic lifts? Well, officially, Olympic lifting is the style of weightlifting utilized in Olympic competition. These competitions include two lifts, each with the goal of getting the heaviest possible weight from the floor to a fully extended overhead position. And while this goal may sound really simple, these patterns actually require a surprising amount of skill and grace to properly accomplish. In fact, I often feel more like I'm practicing a martial art than actually lifting weights when I'm training in this style. The first Olympic lift is known as a clean and jerk, in which two movements are used to get the weight from the floor to a fully extended overhead position. The other Olympic lift is the snatch, which uses only one fluid movement to accomplish the same task. In competition, your max clean and jerk would be added to your maximum snatch, giving you your total for the competition. However, most people utilizing these lifts today are not in competition and have no Olympic goals. Instead, they are using this style of lifting for one or more of its many impressive benefits. This Olympic style lifting does make use of the two official Olympic lifts as well as a number of Olympic style regressions, pseudo Olympic patterns, and useful accessory patterns. You will often see this style of training used in football, basketball, soccer, track and field, and most recently it's been heavily utilized in CrossFit. So why would someone choose to Olympic lift? This is an important question because there are some drawbacks to Olympic lifting. For instance, compared to other forms of strength training such as powerlifting and bodybuilding, Olympic style lifting is more skill focused, meaning that it takes a longer time to master the basic movements and injury risk can be pretty high if you're doing these types of movements improperly. However, when done properly, these lifts are very safe and known for producing some fairly radical results. Probably the most well known of these benefits is the ability of these lifts to drastically increase athletic power, especially in that all important posterior chain. In fact, I was first introduced to Olympic lifting in the early days of YouTube by two incredible videos, which if I can find, I will link below in the description box. The first video was a 5'9", 365 pound Olympic lifter, Shane Hammond, performing a standing backflip with ease, displaying incredible hip power and explosiveness. The second video, no less impressive, was a bro down style friendly gym competition to see who could jump higher, a group of runners or a group of Olympic weightlifters. The runners, one by one, ran up and jumped, reaching up towards a ceiling of maybe, I don't know, nine and a half feet. Most couldn't touch it, but a few of them hit it with their fingertips. Then the Olympic lifters, one by one, grabbed a 25 to 45 pound plate, held it to their chest with one hand, and from a standstill, jumped and palmed the ceiling with the other hand. Olympic lifting is notorious for building this type of power, and my own experience with it corroborates this. Every time I lift in this way, my body links together more powerfully and my vertical, especially my standing vertical, goes way, way up. Another benefit of Olympic lifting, which was less well known before recently being utilized by CrossFit, is its ability to burn calories at a high rate. Full Olympic lifts utilize nearly the entire body, but especially the large muscle groups of the thighs and hips. Firing up all this muscle mass explosively requires the burning of a lot of calories for fuel. A quick set of eight snatches can often feel like a dead sprint and can have the heart rate soaring. And the last major benefit I'll mention is mobility. To properly perform the full Olympic lifts, you must have high levels of ankle, knee, hip, low back, thoracic spine, and shoulder mobility. And if you don't have this type of mobility, a progressive Olympic style routine can help you regain it. In fact, I've known a number of athletes who have solved mobility related joint issues and chronic pains just by Olympic lifting. This is in large part due to the full squat and overhead squat positions, which Olympic lifting makes so much use of. And if you're further interested in that topic and these positions and the type of mobility they create, just check out my video on the resting squat. So how does one perform the Olympic lifts? Well, the two primary Olympic lifts are often too advanced for most beginners. And should you decide to start Olympic lifting, you will likely need to start building a foundation of strength and mobility before moving on to the full lifts. This is usually done by beginning with partial Olympic lifts, each of which trains a different portion of the movement patterns that will eventually come together into the full Olympic lifts. These will be lifts such as front squat, deadlifts, hang cleans, and overhead jerks, among many others. 
These foundational lifts are great for creating the mobility, strength, and power needed to successfully perform the two primary Olympic lifts. In fact, they work so well at this that most athletes only incorporate these lifts, choosing to reap the many benefits they provide without needing to spend the extra time and effort needed to learn the full lifts. Another popular tool for building an Olympic lifting foundation can also be found in kettlebell training. Russian weightlifting programs in particular were known for successfully preparing new lifters with kettlebell progression. Kettlebells are easy for the beginner and great for learning strong hip extension while in stands with lifts such as the swings, kettlebell cleans, and kettlebell snatches. Now of the two primary Olympic lifts, the clean and jerk is usually easier to integrate because its mobility demands are lower than that of the snatch. The clean and jerk is simply a combination of two movements, the Olympic clean and the split jerk. These movements have been further broken down into anywhere between five to eight phases of movement in order to help lifters traditionally learn how to do these rather complicated lifts. However, in an effort to keep a one-on-one -on -one video simple, I've broken it down into only four phases and I've tried to use more common language than what's traditionally used. The clean and jerk begins in the start position, which is basically a slightly modified deadlift. In this position, the feet are generally hip width apart and pointed forward or possibly slightly turned out. Hands are roughly shoulder width on the bar and the bar is placed just above the balls of the feet. From this position, the weight is pulled off the ground and up towards the hip. This is essentially the deadlift phase of the lift. As the weight passes over the knees and nears the hips, the next phase of the movement pattern begins. This being the explosive triple extension of the hips, knees, and ankles. The purpose of this phase of the movement is to powerfully launch the weight vertically, often called the jump phase of the lift, for its resemblance to a standing vertical jump. At this point, if you were to watch a skilled Olympic lifter in slow motion, you would see that they aren't actually supporting the weight anymore. The bar has become airborne, launched upwards by the power of the triple extension. During this time, the lifter is still holding on to the bar, but he's quickly dropping underneath it and into a low squat position. This is where the lifter catches the bar on their shoulders using the front rack upper body position. From there, the lifter finishes a front squat, bringing the weight all the way up to a standing position while still held on the shoulders. This is where the final phase of the movement takes place, the split jerk. Using the hips, knees, and shoulders simultaneously, the weight is explosively pushed up. As the bar launches up off the shoulders, the lifter again drops down underneath it, this time by shooting one foot forward and one foot backward at the same time landing in a split position. The bar is caught in this split stance with the arms fully extended overhead. Once caught, the lifter steps up into a standing position with the weight still fully overhead and arms locked out, officially completing the lift. The snatch, though generally more difficult, is also a simpler movement. This lift can be described in only three steps. The first step is similar to the beginning of the clean and jerk and will still be called the deadlift phase due to its strong resemblance of a modified deadlift. However, the necessary grip for the snatch is quite different, being much wider than that used in the clean and jerk. To find your proper grip placement for the snatch, simply grab the bar with a width which places the bar right at the crease of your hips when you stand up with it. This deadlift phase of the lift brings the bars past the knees and again as the bar starts to near the crease of the hips, the lifter explosively extends the hips, knees, and ankles. This is that same jump phase which explosively launched the bar vertically in the clean and jerk with one major exception. This time the bar must travel completely overhead. To accomplish this, the lifter must triple extend powerfully, then drop down quickly into a deep squat underneath the bar with arms fully extended in that wide grip. The feet are often widened to some degree just before receiving the weight, and after catching the weight overhead, the lifter will extend their knees and hips in order to stand upright with bar fully extended overhead and arms locked out thus completing the lift. Catching the weight in the deep overhead squat position is often the most difficult part of the movement because it requires a lot of strength and stability in a range of motion most people don't have, even when they're not supporting weight. But overhead snatch grip squats are a great way to build up the strength and range of motion required for this particular part of the lift. If you would like to start Olympic lifting yourself, consider looking for a gym with an Olympic lifting coach as your best possible option. However, if there isn't one in your area or you just don't have the money or time for something like that, don't worry. All you need to start your Olympic lifting journey is access to a barbell, some perseverance, and a little focus. Start out with the foundational lifts and build up your strength, skill, and mobility and move on from there. If you would like a trail guide along the way and would like to support the channel, then check out our new Shapeshifters Den Olympic lifting poster by clicking on the link below in the description box. It's an 18 by 24 inch fully illustrated poster containing a skill tree leading to the primary Olympic lifts 
as well as tips, techniques, accessory exercises, and even an anatomy chart showing the primary musculature involved. This is all the information and images I wish I had had when first starting my own Olympic lifting journey. Hope you guys enjoy it. Well, that's it for today. Hope this information helps you on your journey. If you enjoy this content, be sure to like, subscribe, or share the video. Also, be sure to leave any questions, tips, or your own personal experiences with the Olympic lifts down below in the comment section. And until next time, have a great day, and keep moving, everyone. Thank you.